Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Land Your Ground, the video podcast where we talk about all things land ownership. We are here for the landowners and the dreamers, those who are interested in owning land. And we are at episode 10. This week we're going to be focusing on forest management and timber. So uh, we do, do deep dives into various land niches. We've covered farming, ranching, homesteading, and now we're shifting more into the recreational element of land. And we're going to talk about what value timber actually has to you as a landowner. So we're glad you found us. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to Land Your Ground. I'm your host, Chase Burns, and I'm here today with Jordan Sheese, our Howdy. producer. It's good to be back. It's been a little bit since I've been sat down here. Yeah, we we've, we've keep putting guests in that chair, but we're really and glad I, to have you back in front of the mic. I love every minute of that. I like having the guests on because that means we're talking about something cool. Well, they bring a lot to the table, no doubt, but you do too. So we're really glad you're back, Jordan. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'm ready to jump in. I'm excited to talk about I, This is a fun topic for mm -hmm. us. I, I'm not ashamed to admit uh, I, I will unabashedly self-proclaim myself as a tree hugger. I love trees. I just get giddy about trees and foliage and the leaves and cutting timber, running a chainsaw. I, I mean, just being in the forest. I'm, I'm not sycophantic. I mean, I'm not, I'm not afraid to cut a tree, <laughs> but I, I just enjoy them so yep. much, right? Yep. So uh, owning, owning land in the Midwest uh, there's, there's been a lot of joys that come with owning a farm. And I would say one of them is being the manager, being the steward of our forested acres. So I'm super passionate about this topic, but I do know and from experience and, and, uh, just how many landowners I meet with all the time that most of the people who own forested land, they don't know what to do with it. Yep. They don't know what the value of it is. They're intimidated by it. They're just... You know, to them, it's just a whole unknown world, right? Well, yeah, or it gets cleared out. It, you know, they, yeah. it, it gets turned into tillable or whatever, whatever else they want to use it for. And you know, it, it can it has other uses. It does. It does have other uses. Well, I think I think a lot of forest today forest gets abused because people don't know the value of it. Mm -hmm. They they don't know how to monetize it. They don't know uh, what possible revenue streams it could be producing for them. So they're just, the only thing they know to do is, well, let's tear it out and we'll grow crops there or we'll, you know, plant pasture ground and some grasses and we'll put some cows on it. Or, um, you know, the, the ways that most Midwestern, we're going to just focus on that for a minute, Midwestern landowners, the ways that they know to make a profit from their land so that they can justify owning it and paying taxes for it is, uh, I got to convert this timber to something else. Right. 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 Instead of, you know, it could be, and there's a number of things, but we're going to jump into first, like why, why you want to own it. Right. Like why, why it can be so right. good for you. I mean, it's, it's my favorite type of ground to buy. Right. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I, it would be impossible for me to own enough of it. I mm -hmm. think there's, uh, there are a lot of things you can do with it. There's a lot of things that, that excite me about it. Um, and I think it's, it's just very underappreciated. So uh, I think it's a topic that, you know, well overdue for us to give some Absolutely. focus and attention. To. And, and, you know, we, we certainly loved having our guests and we talked a lot about homesteading, uh, cattle farming, uh, a little bit of, uh, crop farming, that kind of thing. You know, we've been all over the place, but we're trying to hit everything and it's hard to hit everything because there is so much in it, you know, cause we've been, we've been bouncing back and forth. It's like we had our two episodes with the homesteading and then we had mm -hmm. uh, the ones before that, the cattle farming. And, you know, it's, it's all tied together cause it's all stuff that we know we, we enjoy you guys practice and, uh, we know yeah. a lot of people are really invested in. So we just, we want to look at all of it. Well, and especially, you know, it, if what you're buying is a flat black class A tillable farm that doesn't have trees on it, then you clearly, there, there are some farms and some types of ground that are just, they're just focused on one niche and that's fine. But there's a lot of the rest of us that kind of fall in middle ground where you're trying to buy some cattle ground, but generally that's the stuff that's rougher or hilly enough that it can't be farmed, right? Because mm -hmm. then it would be too expensive to justify putting cattle on or, or having sheep or whatever other livestock. Right. So by default, a lot of those ranchers end up owning a fair number of timbered acres, and they're just not sure what to do with it other than how many of these trees could I cut to let more sunlight in to put more cows out there. Right. It's their, their management it revolves around how to produce revenue and what, what they, you know, they don't know what they don't know. So 
let's hopefully be able to provide a little bit of education or at least, you know, key into a few topics that things that they should consider doing a little bit more research into or reach out to us about. But if they uh, are interested in learning how to make managing timber a profitable part of a farming operation, then the information's out there and we're going to try to give you some today. So awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> like you said, we yeah. love timber. I, yeah, Jordan and I, for those who don't know, have spent a, a good number of hours in the timber together running chainsaws and, and doing forest stand improvement work. And uh, it is a labor of love. It is some hard work. But, I said, uh, we, what did I say before? I didn't, I wasn't trying to push anybody into it, but boy, I'd do it every day of the week if I could because it was, it was that much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's very rewarding work. So, um, but there's, you know, so there's, it's such a big topic because I think people don't understand how much timber land there is in the United States and how much of that is privately owned. So, I mean, I was not aware of this until we did a little bit of research for this episode. I didn't know the stat exactly, but... Can, can you believe it? Chase doesn't know absolutely I, everything. You know, I know a few. <laughs> I, numbers are not always my strong suit. So yeah. sometimes I got to double check and just make sure that I'm not spouting off of information right. I don't we, know. We wanna, all we want to do is be accurate. 56% of forested land in the United States is privately owned. And that amounts to a little over 750 million acres. So that's, that's not an insignificant amount of land. That's yes. a lot. In Illinois alone, and I did know this stat, but it's a little over 90% of forested acres in the state of Illinois, which is where we are, is privately owned. So for our IDNR, or for our state, to effectively manage that natural resource, they have to work with private landowners. There's no other way. When only 10% roughly of our forested land in the state of Illinois is owned by the state or federal government, nine out of 10 acres are owned by farmers, hunters, homesteaders, hobby farmers, right? So you got to educate those people on what the importance of actually managing that resource is and then teach them how to do it or plug them in with qualified people and organizations that can help them do it. Yeah, so. and there's and there are some resources out there. You know, I spent some time talking. My folks been hunting after that, and then we'll talk more about that later. But there's there's more that you can do with it that you don't even realize. You would never even cross my mind to start looking for. There are, yeah. So what what kind of stuff are they talking about? They're talking about doing. We're trying to make profit centers out of every inch of the land that we have because we don't have a huge property, mm -hmm. and we're yep. trying to turn it into a self sustaining. We've got enough land that we could do some really cool stuff with it, and but there's not quite enough that it could just be a farm and it sustain right. itself yeah. on regular crop like corn or soybean. Mm -hmm. so, Conventional type of farm. Exactly. So we're, we're looking at doing things in the timber that are going to offset some of the other costs of the other things because, and again, make themselves self-sufficient. Uh, things with perennials that you don't have to plant every year. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what are a couple of ones? Elderberries? Yeah. Ginseng? Yeah. Um, a couple of their berry types that I, don't, I, that I don't remember. And those are all things that could become profit. For or sure. Or they can be used by us. You know, we can, who doesn't love jam all, all year round, so right? So elderberry is almost like, uh, I mean, the medicinal purpose of that I've been known for a long, long mm -hmm. time. And I, I don't, I'm not the holistic um guru who could tell you all about that but when my wife got turned on to elderberry several years ago the elderberry syrup we started oh. buying it and using it like anytime cold or flu season comes around we keep jars of that stuff in our refrigerator you if you're starting to feel a little bit of a sniffle or you were around somebody that day that had a cough or something and it's like uh oh, look we better double up on our vitamins tonight or whatever you know we'll take take a shot of that no elderberry syrup oh my gosh dude I swear, I, I do swear. You know, that. you notice a yeah, it a will big give difference. your immune system a bump for sure. Wow. It's it's good stuff. That's cool. Very good. I stuff. didn't know that. Well, no, I'll, and I'll, and I'll, it's not cheap. So if you guys can start raising some elderberry out there, absolutely. I'm to, and you know, there's uh, that's that's definitely an easy DIY project mm -hmm. for any landowner who has that type of stuff on their property. It's elderberry is a pretty easy thing to propagate. And, uh, and it is native, so you can get it in the right soil conditions and stuff. You can get a lot of those plants going, and they put out a pretty good, you know, abundance, a, a good crop. So yeah. it's... Uh, so we, we've been talking about uh, growing them, but turning them into profit, you mentioned this last time mm -hmm. when you were talking with, uh, when you were talking with Megan Clower about knowing where you're actually going to take these things if it's yeah. more than you need, right? What's, what's the market? What's the market for it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know that I don't, I don't know that yet, like where we would actually go with it if we were to. Oh, you guys will have a booth abundance. set up at 
rhubarb fest. Yep. You'll be selling it by the bucket. Yeah, we were talking about <laughs> we talked a little bit about that, but then you know, sure. it's, all, it's also farmers like markets. Is, far, farmers markets for that markets. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's big demand. Yeah, it's it's all about finding that right spot because as long mm-hmm. you can turn you can turn all that stuff into profit as long as you know where you're going to go with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, love it. Yeah. So, but what are the the main things that people think of in the Midwest when they're thinking about value of timber? And um, I think most people just think hardwood trees. They think logs, Mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, if you're, if you're a landowner um, who owns timbered acres, but you're not a hunter in most of the Midwest, you also have the recreational element of it. We was just talking with somebody about this earlier today. They were interested in buying a farm that had potentially you know, a mix of timber and tillable, but they're really just in looking at it as a long-term investment. And they're wondering, what do you do? Or or what is the, uh, how difficult is it to get a hunting lease on something? And is, you know, do I have a lot of liability as a landowner in taking that on? And um, is it worth it? Does it generate enough revenue? And, you know, frankly, the market for that is huge right now, especially in Midwestern states like uh, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Missouri, um, you know, there's hunting leases are even big in Kansas, but the States in the Midwest here where there's a lot of timber hunting lease rates in, in here, in this area run anywhere from about 40 to about 70 plus dollars an acre. So if you owned, if you owned a a hundred acre farm and it was half timber and half tillable, you lease the entire farm. It isn't just the timbered acres. So a hunting lease on that, that brings in 50 bucks an acre on average, you're adding five grand a year on that farm. Just so the 50 acres of tillable ground is cash rented or whatever. And it's bringing some good revenue. And you have this, this other 50 acres that you don't hunt. So it does nothing for you. Right? Well, that's a profit center now, you know, with, um, you know, an annual hunting lease and whatever. And, And there's a lot of, you know, really great people out there that are lined up to be able to, find a good spot to secure for themselves to hunt them and their friend, their family, whatever, but they're just not in a position to buy. They're not landowners right now. Right. Right. So that's creates opportunity for them. That's uh, hunter recruitment and retention is Mm -hmm. a huge issue as we know as conservationists. That's just something that we keep hearing come up over and over and over again. We keep seeing hunter numbers decline every year. And the number one reason that people give for not continuing to hunt the following year is access they didn't they didn't have opportunity to go someplace that was reasonably close to home and that number that we just looked at the uh where it's only 10 percent one tenth of of if the forested area is owned by like federal or whatever right and not even all of that is open to public hunting so So you're you're really talking about you know a portion of probably more like six five six seven percent maybe of uh publicly held lands either state or federal in the state of illinois that's open to public hunting yeah so you know people hold so many hunters right and and you know the the hunting lease game i guess we'll just call it that goes both ways there's definitely hunters that can get a little feathers ruffled because oh gosh i used to hunt this land and now they're leasing it out to people and and they're just not they most of them will tell you that like it's a rich man's game now i just can't afford it they're getting three thousand dollars a year to lease this piece and you know that i used to hunt for free well like i get being unsettled or unhappy about i used to hunt it for free and now if i want to hunt it i have to pay somebody three thousand dollars i understand that we do right Mm -hmm. but at the same time that value is going to a local landowner that helps them hold on to that farm and protect it long term for its highest and best use versus it being developed turned into a solar farm or turned into, you know, who, who knows what subdivision, right? Yeah. What so did, what did we say earlier when we were talking about this is that as just cause it's good for the town or the local area, yeah. it might be bad for the trees because it, it means development. It development. can absolutely be mm-hmm. bad for the forest, which means it's bad for the environment and it's bad for wildlife habitat. So there's a, you know, a myriad of reasons why giving a value, a monetary value to that helps protect it right Mm -hmm. and it it goes that way in perpetuity for most most natural resources um i guess i would just challenge real quick anybody who gets huffy and upset about the hunting lease thing i mean i hear you i get it but there's two solutions to that you either learn how to buy a farm yourself and put yourself in a financial position through a lot of grit and tenacity and patience and effort to do so or you get on board with the program and you work out a deal with the landowner so that you're benefiting them the same way that they're benefiting you. It should be a mutually 
symbiotic relationship. If a landowner is allowing you the privilege of going onto their property and hunting it, you should be willing to either financially benefit them or work it off maybe, you know, to offset it. Anyway, I can get on a rant about that. Yeah, and it, but I mean, you're right because it is going to take a lot of work. I, if I didn't have access to my family's property for hunting, I'd be out of luck. You know, I mean, I'd have, to, I'd have to, I'd have to find something like that. So it all comes down to how hard am I going to work to make sure that that property stays in yeah. our family for as long as I'm alive, at least. Right. And this know? is, this is me. If I sound like I'm preachy and there's anybody that whose toes I just stepped on about, uh, well, you should not be opposed to hunting leases. Listen, what I want for you more than anything is buy your own land, buy your own land, become a landowner live out that dream that you're holding on to or somewhere buried inside of you. And, and it is possible, but you have to get serious about it. Right. Yep. All right. I'm sorry. Derailed <laughs> us. Let's talk timber. So the other thing that really adds value to Midwestern timber is of course, marketable trees. And so the first question that comes up is like, well, what, what kind of money are we talking about? Right? How, how much value do these trees have? And, you know, and of course that varies a lot. The market can be somewhat volatile in certain years in a, you know, downturn, whatever, what happened in COVID. It, it skyrocketed. Yeah, did mean, you have to go to the lumber yard and buy any boards during COVID? So I was in the middle of redoing my bathroom. Oh, when yeah, that started. you know, you know. That was awesome because, I mean, I stopped. We, we, bought, we bought it. Yeah. I think I, I must have been just on the front end of it before it really jumped because we bought that. And then there was a little bit left to do. And I said, I can't do it. I just can't because it, we'll, I think we'll it's finish quadruple. this up later. Yeah, right? we'll do it later. I'll, we'll finish this up. I'm later. okay with a little open board in the bathroom of my little house for a <laughs> while. That'd be all right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2021 is when Jackie and I put on, you know, the wraparound porches and, and built a attached garage and horse barn and all of that. And the price of lumber just went, it went bonkers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, um, there, there are a lot of factors that influence lumber value or, or the, then also the value of timber. So uh, a couple of things happened just last year in 2023. Uh, the two year now, two year long war in Ukraine since Russia invaded uh, has caused a traumatic impact on the uh, timber market for them because they had sanctions against them from EU countries and, and people who no longer are buying their hardwood exports. Yep. So that's too bad for Russia, but for other countries like the United States now, all of a sudden our market here has strengthened quite a bit because, right. you know, the demand has stayed high, but they were a major exporter. And right now nobody's buying their stuff. Yep. Uh, also then last year we had some crazy wildfires in Canada. They had like 18 million hectares of, Timberland that burned last year, which was a, like a record amount. Some of the smoke was making it down here. Do you remember those? Yeah, for I weeks. Think we were out here for a couple of, for one of the yeah, days. Yeah, it was, it was like that. fog and and it was hot out, and you're like, yeah. what is going on? It was and it was making. I had a terrible time because I've got you know I've got stuff where my lungs don't handle smoke mm -hmm. real well. Anyways, so. yeah, it's hard on a lot of people. Yeah. And it was, it was scary to think about. I have friends that live up in Canada, and they said it was just, it was just, it was a real mess, and that yeah. has definitely had an impact on export. How much was it? That, 18, 18 million hectares. So we're talking about, I mean, times that by, I don't, I'm not great with metric. I'm going to say 2.4 acres, 2.6 acres wants to correct us. per hectare. That yeah, comment. do that. Do that. <laughs> set us straight in the comments. We don't speak in metric very well. It's a lot. I mean, you're yeah. talking about over 40 million acres, I believe, that they had destroyed by wildfire. And it, it'll grow back. I mean, it will. But gosh, that takes a long time. Yep. The immediate and short-term effects on our local hardwood and softwood market, what the lumber is going to do this year, it's not going down, guys. So if you're managing timber and you're thinking like, well, is it a good year to sell logs or am I ready to have a timber harvest? The market is plenty firm right now. Yep. And it is going to go up here for the rest of 2024 the way it looks. So. And what, cause what, we, what did we just see that it was lumber price right now is, what was it, 56 cents per Board foot. Or per foot yeah, yeah per foot 56 so you're talking 564 i think what it was dollars yep. per thousand board feet right yep it moved around a little bit yep it was 564 just from the last yeah. time we were looking so, at it so that's that's basically everything in the hard and softwood spectrum all kind of combined and averaged out i think is what that figure is that you're talking about so if you break that down a little bit further kind of by species i mean uh, because of this you know if we're talking about how many acres total uh in the united states 
751 million that were privately owned, right? So down in southern states, especially where they have a lot of pine forests, there's a lot of those states that even the state land is being much better managed than a lot of the federal lands are from from a timber production standpoint, they do select cutting, they do apply good practices on a lot of those uh, areas, but just of the privately owned land, there's a big portion of that down south that's uh, uh, pine stands, pine forest, and and that's a silviculture, it's an agricultural practice. They're growing uh, red pine and jack pine and stuff that they're they're growing it for pulpwood or saw lumber, and I mean, it's big business, you know, soils down there areas that maybe don't grow conventional row crops very well but they sure grow pine trees really well so those people have been putting those uh larger tracks and you know uh that sort of lumber production long term making really good use out of their land yeah i would love to interview somebody down there that's that's got a big um big pine stand or owns you know a substantial pine plantation and just learn more about that because we don't have that here, right? Most of our timber land in the Midwest, so, you know, again, Michigan, Illinois, uh, Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, and northern half of Missouri and that type of stuff. We have a lot of rolling hills where it's too rugged to farm. We have trees, and those trees are just kind of wild, natural. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't be managed. They're just uh, because we didn't plant them and they're not in rows doesn't mean that it's not a crop because it is. Right. Um, so there's certain species of timber here that are going to make up the high end of the spectrum lower end of the spectrum and everywhere in between that are just kind of make up our in Illinois and in this part of Illinois, especially we have most of our native forest would be, uh, Oak hickory. So those are the two predominant species. And it's just referred to that as like Oak hickory forest. Um, there's other types, you know, when you get down to the floodplains and stuff where you might have a little bit more softwood, you'd have cottonwood and you might have, uh, ash and maple and you know, a lot of silver maple, things like that. Willow. Those are, um, poplars, lower quality, faster growing trees because of wetter soils, but lower quality, lower value. So then so, what would be the, what's the most valuable tree in our Midwestern era, area then? Here in our market, it's going to be black walnut and black walnut is king by a lot. So black walnut trees are going to, going to run anywhere from about three to $11 a board foot, depending on grade and, and quality. Um, the next highest species, so let's just say mid-range, average quality in a black walnut is maybe just say 4 to $6 a board foot. Okay. Um, lower, the next step under that, after that species, is going to be probably cherry. And then you'd move a little bit further down and get into things like ash and maple. White oak is going to fall right in there, really close to cherry. But any of those species is going to be easily a third of what the average black walnut is going to be. So... Good quality black walnut is three to six times as valuable as any other species that grows here in our timber. Wow. So it's, I mean, it's substantially higher. So um, the, the higher percentage or the higher, the more dominant that species is in your stand of timber, the more value you're just going to have. But uh, it is fairly slow growing. So it, it's good to not just manage for one species either. You wow. wouldn't how long does it take for it to grow on average, like to get to that point where they could be market cut? size. Mm-hmm. So a marketable black walnut, it, it takes about 60 years on average, which is not, not fast, right? It's a, that's why they call it a hardwood. It's a slow growing species. There's some things you can do that would help it grow faster than that when you apply certain management techniques. And then there's also going to be, um, there's also going to be certain, uh, things that you could do that are going to, not just speed it up, but increase or decrease the quality of the wood because the faster it grows, the more sunlight it has, the faster it grows, you know, the, the less desirable the wood grain is going to be to some extent, but on average native tree that just has, uh, enough sunlight grows fairly straight somewhat has some competition around it is going to be good quality. And it's going to take about 60 years to get to maturity. A tree that takes 60 years to get to maturity, though, is going to be approximately 19 inches DBH. So DBH, diameter at breast height. You is that what that? No, I have yeah. never, I never so heard that. This is a term foresters use when they, they're, you know, they, if they're talking size, they don't tell you how tall it is or how, you know. So the reason they diameter at breast height is I, I use that as like, well, it's four and a half feet off the ground. So if I walk up to a tree being six foot tall, and I reach my arms around it like this, and I can just touch my fingertips, 
that's approximately 19 inches across in really? diameter, diameter at breast height. So if I can't touch my fingers, we've got a marketable log. If I'm wrapping around and I can touch wrist to wrist, we probably need a couple more years and that's, and so on. Right. Um, something that I've noticed though, when a lot of people look at walnut trees and their timber, they underestimate the age of those walnut trees. They, they will a lot of times look at it and just almost write them off because they'll see trees out there that are eight inches, nine, 10, 12, maybe inches in diameter. And they're just like, Oh gosh, walnut trees grow so slow. Like that tree is going to be, you know, my kids are going to be married and, uh, you know, way, way past, you know, college age by the time I can harvest those trees. So they're no use to me. Right. They, they think that now I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I was guilty of this when we first bought our farm because you know, I, I didn't know the age of a tree at a given size at that point. I knew w at what size it became valuable or marketable, but I wasn't quite sure like how fast it would have actually gotten there from the size they were when I bought them. And so when I bought our farm, uh, I hiked through the timber for the first time and started noticing some walnut trees, kind of taking note of them. And I'm like, well, okay, these, these trees are probably about 10 inches. These are about 13, 14 inches. And I thought, gosh, it'd be nice to think that maybe we could harvest some of these someday and it could help pay for my kids' college. My kids were little at the time. And I thought, yeah, that's probably a pipe dream. I don't think that's going to happen, Chase. You know, I just, I thought, they, maybe I can hope that those trees will be ready to cut by the time I'm ready to retire. But what I didn't understand at that point that I've since learned a lot more about is that growing a, a walnut tree or growing any hardwood tree is a lot like growing a mutual fund. Uh, there's compound interest. Or if you're more familiar with, say, growing livestock, if we use that as an analogy, think about how many days it takes to get a feeder pig to market weight. When you get 50% of the way there, you know, let's say, and I don't know the number of days, somebody put that in the comments too, educate me. Tell me, tell me how many days it takes from the time it's a tiny little piglet until the time we're ready to send that baby to market at about 260, 270 pounds. Um, but I know that it, it's less than a year. So we're talking about probably like, let's, I don't know, eight months, nine months, 10 months, something like that. So, but if we're 50% of the days through that process, do you think that pig, if, if the goal is to get it to 260 pounds, do you think it's 130 pounds at 50, 50% of the days halfway there? I guess I don't know. No, you think, think about this. The pig does not grow at an even pace the entire time. Oh, okay. So 50% of the way there, you might still just have like a 50 pound pig, you know? I mean, it, it really, it takes a while cause it grows slowly at first. Right. And we, we look at them and say, wow, that pig's really growing fast. Well, you can be three months in the process and it still isn't a very big pig. It hasn't added a whole bunch of weight. Same way. We'll go back to the financial analogy. If that's something that people are just more <laughs> following a little bit better. Right. right? Anybody out there have a 401k, you know, you have a Roth IRA and you're thinking, boy, I'd sure like to retire here in about 10 years, but you're looking at your account and you're just like, I still only got $230,000 there. Like I can't retire on that. I'm going to need over well over a million dollars. And it's that last four or five years that all of a sudden compound interest kicks in. The bigger the number gets, the faster it grows. Right. Right. So the faster, the closer you get to market size in a tree, the faster the growth accelerates because what grows a tree? Sunlight, Boom. water, mostly sunlight, man. Mostly sunlight. Yeah. I mean, it's photosynthesis. So it's using the UV light, right? It's gathering up sunlight and you know, Chlorophyll's doing its thing up there, photosynthesizing, and it's converting starches and sugars, and, psh, and the tree trunk just swells. It's stealing carbon out of the air, right? And it's just adding bulk. It's adding wood. So what it's doing, the bigger the tree gets, the bigger the canopy gets, the more leaves it has on, the more surface area out there that's photosynthesizing, and then the faster it's adding board feet to had, its log. I had no idea that that... So, would so, be even be a way to <laughs> way to predict it. I, I was... So what I've found out, like I'm looking at these trees, right? And go back to when we first bought our farm and I'm looking at all these oak trees that are like 10, 12 inches and thinking, geez, that could be another 20, 30 years before those things are ready to cut. I could cut them right now. Really? And that was 10 years ago. Yeah. Wow. And I mean, there's some of them that are anywhere from 19 to 25 inches. Wow. So they're... Uh, they were 10 years away. So if they're... If let's, and I haven't... I haven't driven a bore into any of them to check rings and really, and I haven't cut any yet. So I haven't counted age, but let's just say market size. 
is approximately 60 years on average. I was looking at some of those being probably 48 to 52, 54 year old trees, if that's the case, and didn't realize. I underestimated grossly. I thought maybe they were 30, 35, 40 years at most, you know? I thought they were still 20 plus years away from being ready to cut because they didn't impress me with their size. But the bigger they get, the faster they grow. So you can have a tree that's only about a four or five inch tree that might be a 25 or 30 year old tree. They just grow that slowly at first. And then once it really starts to get some size to the canopy, all of a sudden the trunk shoots up. That's fascinating. And you know, we talk, we of course talk about cutting down trees, but plant a lot of trees as well, right? I we mean, have planted a lot. You've put, you've put in a lot. I've, I came out and helped one time when we were putting in trees and well, that was an interesting set of, <laughs> set of circumstances. I mean, it was just... <laughs> It was fun, and I because I'd never planted trees quite yeah. like that before. I won. That's something that I'd like to be <clears throat> doing more of. But you know, we got limited space. Once things change, maybe we'll be putting more in on our property, whatever. But mm-hmm. you know, it's 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 great to be. It feels really good to plant a tree that I'm never going to get get to sit under the shade of because that's like. And I know that's a I know that's an old saying proverb. or whatever proverb yeah. whatever it was that. But it's like knowing that that tree is eventually going to be. And we we planted we planted one that we call the, the, uh, oh, the peanuts tree, you know, like the Charlie Brown, the Charlie <laughs> Brown tree that, that we yeah. have, we've planted. And yeah, seeing it, like it shot, it shot up, I guess. I never even realized that that might be part of why it was so it, it's slow at the beginning and just mm-hmm. keeps getting quicker and quicker. And hardwood trees are, are notoriously slow. And this is why most people don't plant them. Most people, if they were going to plant a tree in their yard, they pick a maple or a sycamore or uh, an American linden, which is just a fancy term for basswood. So they pick something like that because they want a shade tree and they want it right now, right? Yep. They want that thing to get some size to it and actually serve a purpose as fast as possible. And I don't fault them for that, <clears throat> but they, they stop with planting those softwood trees in there. Why would anybody even bother to plant a white oak or plant a black walnut or plant a you know, a pecan or a hickory or a chestnut or something that takes, you know, 15 years before it looks like anything. Well, you, we have to train ourselves to think in generations when you're managing timber instead of just thinking about, you know, how quickly am I personally going to benefit from this? If I was thinking about how quickly I was going to benefit from oak trees being planted, I might never plant any of them, or at least not if I'm like 40 or 50 plus years old, you know, if you're still 20, 25, 30, okay. You probably talk yourself into planting a few because you're hoping to be around to see them really, yep. you know, start producing some hard mast and, you know, start attracting some wildlife or whatever. But you have to adopt philosophies that basically it's our way of giving back to the land everything that it gives to us. And yes, we can sustainably harvest timber, but if the quality of a forest stand is not good, then it needs more than just like giving some sunlight and giving, which is what we had here on our place, right? It was, it was 50 plus percent lower quality trees that we wanted to eliminate and promote some better quality trees. Kind of hitting a restart button. It's, it's not just, well, let's selectively cut out some of the good so that more good can grow. We had to put more good there. I don't know that I'll benefit that much from that in my lifetime, but I'm hoping that my kids will or whoever owns this farm 25, 35, 55 years from now will walk through our timber and they'll be like, wow, this is great. So as a land broker, when you're looking at properties and like, cause you, you go and walk timber when you are looking at a property. Don't a you? lot. Yeah. So you've seen, so when you go in, how much does that play into how much property is worth? Considerably. Yeah. So, I mean, the difference between low grade, low quality timber and really, really good quality, well-managed timber in this area can be anywhere from 350 to probably probably upwards to like 11 or $1,200 an acre different in value. Really? Wow. And, and that's on larger size tracks. So let's say 40 plus acres. When you get into smaller, you can have, now you can have a small timbered tract. I've seen 20 or 30 acre timber bottoms that were just heavily stocked with high value veneer quality black walnut. That's timber ground, maybe even floodplain timber ground that was worth 12 to $15,000 an acre. Wow just because of the value of the trees. Now, once you cut those trees and harvested them, it's back to being $2,500 to $3,500 an acre ground. But it had, it, it could, it's possible for a high enough quality stand, and especially in smaller parcel size like that, to really 
push the value of timber up that much. But sure. on average, it's, you know, it's going to be more like probably 500 to $1,200 an acre range. Okay. Good quality timber being at the top of that, lower quality. So timber that might go 3500 to $3,800 an acre could be worth 4300 to maybe 5100 an acre, you know. So, so what, what would you say is like an offset then? Like if you buy, if you bought that 30 acres, all that walnut, what do you do after you pull it all out of there? You kind of start over. I mean, so this is where sustainably managing a piece of timber ground, you, the goal would be to get it into a cycle where you don't ever just have like mature age structure and then nothing growing underneath of it, just open canopy so that when you cut out all of those mature trees, you're back to year one and you got to regrow everything from scratch, right? That's, that would be poor quality management where there's no age structure. Ideally, we would selectively harvest trees in a way that lets in sunlight, lets other stuff quickly fill in the gaps and, and take advantage of the sunlight that it got and get to a cycle where every seven or eight years we can go back into the same stand and selectively cut out the trees that need to be removed for the health of the timber, sell those trees, and then within six to nine years after that, seven or eight on average, get back in there and do the same thing again and just keep repeating, keep repeating. So that's how you can keep good, you can keep a good value on that property you, that while would be, still maintaining like an, like a profit out of it regularly. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So there, there've been plenty of instances where a, a sizable harvest, let's say somebody has an 80 acre piece here uh, and we're just going to stick with the 50, 50, we'll say 40% or 40 acres of it is hardwood timber and the other 40 is row crop or other types of habitat and whatever. And they're just, well, you know, I'm getting some cash rent on this 40 acres of tillable ground, but I don't know what I can do here with this 40 other acres. So you could go in there and have a timber harvest. If, if it's a good quality, well-managed stand, you should be able to do a harvest in there. You might be able to cut something like let's say $80,000 worth of hardwood trees off of it. So you go back in there eight years later and do another harvest of the same amount. And you keep doing that every eight years that you take that $80,000 and you spread it out over eight years. You got $10,000 a year worth of additional supplemental income off of that farm. They, they might not have been getting that much more out of the cash rent, you know, on right. that 40 acres. So you don't get it each year but it's a big lump sum when you do get it and you just kind of spread that out, you know, over the cycles in between harvests and it's a considerable revenue stream. Yep. Just that, most people would just ignore that because they don't know the value of it. They don't understand how to get into that sort of routine where they are sustainably harvesting it in a cycle with predictable revenue cash flow. Well, that comes down to what you guys mentioned in our last in the last episode was that it's all about planning right? You got to yeah. make a plan for everything that you're going to do with whatever land you buy, because making a plan is how you're going to make it work best for you. Whether it's a homestead, whether it's a timber stand, whether it's a cattle farm, whatever it is, it's mm. going to work best if you plan well in advance. Yeah. Yeah. And so most of these people who don't have that knowledge, they don't have that background and I don't expect them to, you know, they, they didn't go to school for that. They're just, they, whether they're a farmer or they're, you know, their interest is all in hobby farming and how do I make that as self-sustaining as possible, but I have these 20 acres of trees or whatever. They don't know anything about it. And the thing is like, how often do we have to do something before we get good at it or before we get knowledgeable about it? There's an exact number, right? And I don't remember what, <laughs> if it, what it is, is. Teach me. No, I was just going to think, think as we're setting up for this podcast, if we did it every other day, boy, it'd be like clockwork. We'd know exactly what we were doing. Everything go just boom, boom, boom. Right. But if you don't do it for two weeks, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I forget. Oh, I don't. Oh, I think it goes this way. The more frequently you do something, the better you get at it, the more knowledgeable, the more you retain that information, right? You're, you become yep. an expert by doing something frequently and getting really good at it. If you're only doing a timber harvest once every eight or 10 years on your 20 acres, how are you supposed to know what the value is every eight or 10 years? How, how, you're going to forget half of what you learned by the time it was time to go in there and do it again, right? Right. So the, the best thing that you can do if you're in that position is to work with a consulting forester. There are experts out there and they're well worth the money that they charge to do a consultation or they can come in and do 
uh, a full inventory of what your trees are. They can mark trees and they can give you a complete inventory list of species, size, uh, value. They can tell you approximately how many board feet you have of each species per acre and, and give that sort of a report so that for a couple of reasons. One, you could, let's say you just bought a farm. Having a consulting forester come in and give you a valuation of what the standing timber is would be a really smart thing to do because if you bought the farm for a million dollars and you had a, a forester come in and give you a valuation today and you have $225,000, let's just say $250,000 worth of standing trees on the farm right now. And then over the next five years, you have a timber harvest and they come in and they cut $200,000 worth of trees, whatever. And then a little bit later on after that, you sell the farm. So you've had a million dollars. Now you sold $200,000 worth of trees off of the farm, right? you pocketed that money, well, you effectively reduced the value of the farm by that $200,000 when you sold those trees off of it. If you, if you don't have a valuation to begin with, you don't have that basis, it's really hard for you to explain to the IRS later how when you sold that farm later, what your taxable gain was from what you bought it for, say you sold it for a million and a quarter five years later. So you had a $250,000 gain. Well, if you showed them, actually, I sold $200,000 for the trees. I reduced the value of my property by this much. You can deduct that harvest from your taxable gain. So hmm. you could go from having a, a $250,000 taxable gain down to a $50,000 taxable gain. Now you're going to pay taxes on the income from those trees that you sold, but you were going to pay that either way. But you can reduce your by having that basis. But if you didn't have that forester come in and tell you what the value of the property was with the trees on it and what the value of the trees was, then when you remove those trees, you would have had no idea how much you changed the value of the land. So it's, there's, there's definitely a tax advantages in that way. If you're ever buying or selling reselling land to know what the value was before you did a timber harvest, cause you can use that later. That this, so one thing that is definitely a good takeaway and something that I'm just picking up as we're talking about it is I would never have any idea to ask anybody for a consulting forester that would never cross my mind if I bought a piece <laughs> you of didn't property. know that was a thing well I, I mean working kind with of. you I heard of it but like just thinking like when I'm going and looking at looking at things yeah. that wouldn't cross my mind yeah. so that'd be something good to ask your land broker or whoever you're working with when you're looking for property is was there anything else I need to be uh, looking for can, like this is a Great time for shameless plug. <laughs> Gotta give a shameless plug. Yes, this if you're looking at buying a farm, any any farm that has forested land on it, this is a huge advantage to somebody who decides to work with an experienced accredited land agent, a broker who works exclusively in rural properties and land versus just using a regular real estate broker, because they're not gonna know any of this stuff. They're just not. They don't. They don't deal in it. They don't live it every day. Um, they don't own farms. Most of them, you know, that that they're doing this type of stuff on their own property. So when you're you're living it, walking it every day, and you're managing your own land, and then you you're just better equipped to answer questions when those questions come in from buyers, and and it's a big asset that they're purchasing. And and here's the reality: of it, is like most of the people who buy timber land, or the people who now own that. 90% of the forested acres in Illinois. I don't have a stat on this, but I can tell you from my personal experience that the vast majority of those people who own those 90%, they know the least about that asset of anybody else in this part of the country who has that much money invested in something and doesn't know the value. So there's there's this huge deficit, this difference between the people who own it and the people who know something about it and it we got to fix that. Yep. It's yep. just education is how we fix that. And if you're not educated on it, that's okay. But we need to find you somebody who is, you need to get connected with somebody who, who is, because when I said people are intimidated by it, it's, have you ever heard a horror story about somebody that had a timber harvest done and they're just, or I can't say that I have personally. Okay. Well, gosh, I'm biased because I, I deal with this every day, I suppose. So I, I hear these stories and I meet with people who are just like, oh, gosh, no, I would never want to have a logger come into my timber because I hear they make such a terrible mess or they, you know, they, they cut trees that I, you get taken advantage of because they'll come in and they cut trees that weren't marked and they, you know, take more than they're supposed to or they rut everything up and they leave a big mess. And they're, 
So there's, they hear these things. It's just talk, you know. And by and large, most of the people who are harvesting trees and who work in the timber business are good folks. And, and they're doing their best to really manage a sustainable resource. And I'm going to be advocates for them here for a minute because I know some who are great. They really do a good job of it, and they're good land stewards. But there are plenty of them out there that are maybe just more of the fly-by-night type of operation. They're going to cut everything they can off of a farm, everything that you'll let them, because they know they're just trying to make a dollar there, and then they're going to move on, and they'll probably never come back to that farm or even that area again. And for those those folks who operate that way, they've really cast a big shadow over the, the industry as a whole. So it gets a bad rap. There's a whole lot of loggers out there that have a black eye because there's a few out there that really take advantage of people because they know they can say, oh gosh, yeah, you got some great trees in here. I'd probably give you $50,000 for these. And then they're gonna turn around and sell those trees for $250,000 and, and pocket that and not ever look back. And right. it's because they know they could. The, the older, you know, grandma, grandpa who owns this farm or whatever, they had no idea that $50,000 sounded like a lot of money to them. They have no idea what the value of it is. And so this, this fear about being taken advantage of causes a lot of those landowners to just kind of live in paralysis where they just don't manage their timber. I, if I sell trees, I know I'll be taken advantage of. Somebody will you know, mess us over. We won't get a tenth of what we should have, and they'll leave us with a big mess, and, and they, you know, talk themselves out of doing it. So then they're just like, nope, 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 we're not cutting any trees. Well, then the quality of the timber slowly goes downhill over the years because it wasn't being effectively managed. They missed out on a huge revenue stream on their farm. Meanwhile, they're trying to tear out trees everywhere they can just so they can plant some more crops and stuff to try to bump up and make their farm a little bit more profitable because they need more money to keep paying all these expensive bills. Cost of everything keeps going up. And the only way they know to do that is to plant more corn or more beans or whatever. If they knew how to manage their timber, they would understand that they can generate a substantial amount of money off of that yeah, without having to plant it every year and fertilize it. Yeah. So there's a lot and gosh, you, you just get, it's, it's, it's a shame that we don't, it, this feels like stuff that you ought to be taught. I wouldn't, maybe not in school, <laughs> but it feels Somewhere. like it's, it's almost like there needs to be a uh, landowner's, guide to everything or something along those lines isn't you know that us I mean? is that us i hope that's us it's that's becoming us that's what we're trying to be <laughs> right it's it's if you're tuned in right now you found somebody who can at least get you on the right path that's our goal yep. is we're just educating landowners helping them become better land stewards teaching people who are aspiring to become landowners how to make it possible understanding what all these possible revenue streams are how to how to get the most out financially of their investment, but while still doing it in a way that's like symbiotic with nature yep. and benefits the wildlife and, you know, just because, I mean, you mentioned it before, both conservationists, that's huge. That's huge priority on our list is making sure that not only if people find the land that's right for them, that they want to do whatever they want to do on it, but also that it's going to be well taken care of because that is, that probably is priority number one, a lot of the time, because it's, it's important, you know, it's important that the trees, especially if you want to be somebody that wants to sell your land someday, maybe, or anything like that, you want to make sure that it's in the best shape that it can be in for whatever, whatever you're going to use it for. Right. Right. It, or even if it's just your goal to have a legacy farm that you're going to leave to the next generation, don't you want to hand them something that is an absolute gem instead of just whatever a, it is, a diamond in the rough at best, mm -hmm. you know, it, you have the potential while land is under your care and your ownership to really be the one that takes that rough looking rock and cuts it and polishes it and makes it into something that's super valuable that would be a family heirloom so to speak that's uh consulting forester i want to go back to that real quick on that topic before we just move on or, or tie it up for the night i want to say that uh consulting foresters are are available in almost every area of every state in the United States. I mean, forestry is, um, is a pretty big industry in this country, and there are a lot of accredited, reputable people who do that for a living. Even in the Midwest, where maybe we don't have quite as, we don't have the tree farms to the level that we do south of the Mason-Dixon line, but we still have 
uh, a lot of really good folks that are, are extremely knowledgeable and their primary goal is to write force management plans that help landowners learn how to develop and execute a plan that, that maximizes timber production, helps them raise some valuable trees and reaches all of their landowner goals. And that's the other reason that people are kind of sometimes shy away from, well, if I work with a forester, their only interest is in growing logs. And I, I want my timber to have lots of turkeys and to be really good deer hunting. And so I'm, you know, I'm not just here to raise logs. That's not why I bought timber. And I understand that. And so do most foresters. Most of them are, most of them are conservationists and, and hunters themselves. I mean, they get it. So if you tell them from, opening part of your first conversation, hey, I bought land because, you know, X, Y, Z, this is what the goals that I want to achieve. Their objective is to help you reach your goals, but they're going to teach you how to do that by sustainably managing your timber. And you can do it in certain, apply certain techniques that are going to be more fruitful for wildlife objectives and maybe other techniques that are going to be a little bit more towards, well, we're going to maximize, you know, we're going to manage for the higher value species like black walnut and some of those other things. So you have a lot of input with that consulting forester as they kind of start to develop a plan and, um, and put together something that, that guides you like your roadmap through the next 10 years of management in between those, those harvest cycles. Yeah. The important thing though, that I'm taking away is that you don't have to go about it alone. There's resources. No, absolutely. People not. you can find and seek out that will help you figure all this out because yeah. you know, I'm, I'm one, I don't ask for directions, which you don't really have to anymore with cell phones, but I don't, I don't stop on the side of the road to ask for directions. But if there was something big like this, it's not a bad idea to ask for a little bit of help. Yeah. And we're really well connected with a lot of uh, managers in different parts of the Southeast, Southwest, um, southern states, northeast, I, in almost every state, let's say every state east of Kansas, I can put you in touch with somebody who can either help with a management plan or uh, somebody who does this full time. I mean, there's those resources are available, but drop it in the comments. If you're tell us where you're at, and if you have a specific question about who to talk to or how to manage land, or you need help being put in touch with some of those resources, a consulting forester or something like that, reach out to us. Well, there's nothing in it for us, but we'll be glad to help you. Won't we, Jordan? Yep. That's what we're here for. All right. Oh, you know, what would be cool is to have a consulting forester on sometime. I'm working on Maybe it. Maybe we circle back to this sometime in the future and <laughs> find somebody. We're going to be there sooner than you think, actually. Fantastic. I've got a couple of them lined up that I think uh, we won't just talk forestry and forest management when we get one of those guys in here, the first one anyway. Um, but there's going to be a couple of, of people that work in this industry full time that we're going to. Very uh, cool. Yeah, we're going to get them here, man. This was definitely a fun topic. I mean, we said at the beginning. We love timber, so it was really nice to get to talk about it for a good while. And I'm glad that we're having people on to talk more about this kind of stuff and a lot of others as we get more and more guests coming in and we just keep trucking right along. Yeah, and if you guys in the meantime are wanting to hear a little bit more or read more about some of this, definitely log in there and subscribe. Give us your information for the newsletter. I encourage you all to sign up for that. Uh, we're putting out weekly articles on each of these topics that uh, kind of go one step further, a little deep, deeper dive into some of this give you some more free information, a little bit more fine tuned in the topic that we touch on or talk about on the podcast. Like, and subscribe to join our tribe. We appreciate it if you follow us on all the socials, that would be Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at land your ground. And you can find our full podcast on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple podcasts. We're looking forward to seeing you next time here on land your ground. Mm -hmm.